This portion of TV Confidential is brought to us by our friends at Front Porch Realty Group, the community of realtors in the Northern Bay area of California that is committed to finding the solution that is best for their clients. Whether you're a first-time home buyer or looking to sell or lease your property in Northern California, call 415-886-7411 or visit frontporchrealtygroup.com for more information on how they can help you. Hi, this is Constance Towers. And welcome to TV Confidential. Ed Robertson, welcoming you back to TV Confidential Radio Talk Show about television. That is pleased to welcome Mr. Titus Welliver. Titus Welliver, the actor who plays LAPD homicide detective Harry Bosch on the Amazon Prime series Bosch, and a man once described as the real reason that you need to get Amazon Prime. In the first place, season five of Bosch is set to drop a little later on in 2019, while the series has also been renewed for a sixth season. We will talk some more about that in just a second. But first, Titus, let me just start off by telling you I'm a late bloomer to Bosch. Uh, (laughs) All right. Even if you didn't bloom at all, that's fine, too. What's nice about it is that those who had never read the book found the show, you know, on Amazon, and then sort of... uh, did a little reverse engineering and have gone back and not even back, but are, are reading the books and vice versa. So it's interesting how everyone finds their way ultimately. Yeah, and what's particularly cool about the show and the way it's put together, I can see why it's addictive because watching the show is as close to the experience of reading not only the Connolly novels, but any novel. Yeah. Now, granted, it helps that the streaming service cues up the next episode. But when you think about it, that's not unlike the experience of reading a book. Because, okay, you read the first four chapters and you decide, okay, do I stop here or do I go on? So it's really perfect for binge watching. And it works that way by design, depending on the genre. But there are a lot of books where you find you're you're, you're doing precisely that. You're reading it and... You're so enjoying it that you don't want to stop, but you realize that you don't want to speed that enjoyment. You want to sort of relish it. So I think, and everyone does that at their own pace. I found that when I started to read the books, I read a couple of books Mm -hmm. Mm there in advance when we were shooting the pilot, but I've now read all the books, and I found that I really could not do my sort of typical thing of uh, reading in bed at night with the Connolly books because I couldn't stop reading them. Yeah. And the first one I ever read in bed, I recall, I mean, it was two or something, three in the morning, and my wife rolled over and said, really? Are you, are you kidding me? And I don't know if she thought I was having some sort of a midlife crisis or had lost my mind and was doing shadow puppets. I mean, she just couldn't fathom that I would be up at that time of the evening and, or in the morning. And I just told her, I said, okay, I'm sorry, sorry. But I realized that I had not been conscious of the amount of time that had passed at all. So for me, the reading of those books took place either on an airplane or on a beach in a place where I was uninterrupted because I would go through the book. One of the books I've read flopped on a beach in Tulum. We were on a holiday, and, and I suddenly uh, realized that the light had changed dramatically. <laughs> so I was terribly sunburned, and I was just closing the book, having finished it. An actor is an artist, but you're an artist artist in addition to being an actor. And I would imagine because you have that sensibility born in you, you probably appreciate the fact that time changed and light became dark during that one day when you're reading that particular novel. Oh, absolutely. And I I think depending on what kind of a visual artist one is, because I I paint paintings in nature, or of nature, rather. I'm very conscious of the light, particularly when I'm looking at a painting spot. I'll go back and revisit that area multiple times at different times of the day because I want to see how the light affects that image and what the most desirable time of day to capture that. So, yes, I'm very aware of it, sometimes almost to the point of being (laughs) self-conscious. On the line with us is Titus Welliver. Titus plays LAPD 
homicide detective Hieronymus Bosch on Bosch, the Amazon Prime series based on the best-selling novels by Michael Connolly. Season 5 of Bosch will premiere later in 2019, while the first four seasons, first 40 episodes of Bosch are available right now for streaming on demand. You can follow Titus Welliver on Twitter at Welliver underscore Titus, as well as on Instagram at Titus Welliver Official, as well as at Welliver Art, where you can see some samples of Titus's work on his Instagram account. I'm not an art scholar, Titus, but from what I can tell, and I think you kind of alluded to this just a few minutes ago when you were talking about describing your own work, there seems to be an impressionistic vibe to some of your work. Very much so. And by the way, I am not an art scholar myself, so <laughs> uh, um, I, kind of, I kind of make it up as I go along to be completely straight about it. Well, that's because you're an artist, you're a doer. Well, I studied formally and did all that, and obviously growing up with both parents being artists, my mother was a fashion illustrator, and then late in her career uh, started to illustrate books. My father was a fine artist. He was uh, an abstract expressionist, Mm -hmm. I would say, but he did landscapes. It sort of becomes the thing that you know. uh, My parents certainly did not push us in any direction whatsoever, but both parents had studios, and, you know, when you're a kid, particularly with my parents, that thing of saying that you were bored just didn't fly. So it was always, you know, my father had reams of butcher's paper and old coffee cans filled with <laughs> crayons and magic markers. So it all sort of just kind of fell into place in that way. But going back to you sort of become what you know, mm-hmm. I spent a tremendous amount of time with my father in the woods when he was painting. But he was a plein air painter. I mean, he would literally tramp, you know, 15 miles on snowshoes on to the middle of God knows where on the main Canadian border up around Allagash, Maine, and with a 80-pound backpack with an easel and paints and the like and set up his little French easel and, and do a study. And, you know, it was harsh. It was, you know, really harsh. Cold, cold, cold. I and mean, he could paint only for a certain amount of time because until his hands would start to freeze. Yeah. But he had these uh, battery-powered mittens that he could slide his hand into. So I think everyone in our family at some point or another uh, experienced frostbite <laughs> from joining him on those treks. But I found that that was not the case. It, my source of inspiration was one that was maybe uh, um, maybe it was due to my frostbite. Uh, <laughs> I found that I like to go into a place of power, I suppose, some place that, that really moves me and sort of look at it and analyze it and, and, and from many different angles and different times of day. And that happens often. Sometimes I'll, I will be driving by a place in northwestern Connecticut where I have a home, and I've driven by that marsh a thousand times and always thought to myself, it's a beautiful place. You know, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it's getting that summer orange coating over the tops of the trees, Mm -hmm. late afternoon light, and I'll stop the car and turn around. So I've found paintings in that way several times, and I think that that's sort of my process. But going out and being on the scene and doing the study and then going back into my studio and enlarging it is not how I do it. I kind of get the image in my head. I don't in any way preserve the image with photographs. I tried that many years ago and found that all I was doing was basically doing a version of the photograph, but just recreating the photograph, and it kind of left me cold, and it didn't have the, the gravity, that visceral experience whatsoever. And so I look at something, and then I go back, and I really do. I just kind of make it up as I go along. But the way I know that the painting works in the end, when I get to it, is that it feels right. There's some, for me, some facsimile, visceral facsimile emotion that the painting provoked. And that's very personal. Other people can look at that painting and go, I don't get that. <laughs> which, is, which is okay, because, yes, there is good art and there is bad art, but all art is somewhat subjective. It's like people looking at a Picasso and saying, you know, my three-year-old could do that. Well, no, your three-year-old could not do that. Um, there's a tremendous amount 
skill and thought that goes into that. And yet some people's impression of something like that is that it's very, very simple and not at all uh, thought out. Yeah, I can look at one of your paintings, and when I look at it, I bring my experience, and the image may evoke something from my experience that will create the feeling of enjoyment or what exactly is he doing there, whereas my neighbor across the street can look at that same painting, and he has completely different experiences, and that's sort of the beauty of art in a nutshell. I agree. 100%. 100%. I agree 100%. And I know my father has this experience. And I, you know, I, of course, did too because I spent a lot of time in museums as a child. And mm-hmm. some of it was drudgery, you know, honestly. But there were those paintings where you would look at them and have a desire to go into that painting, to be present in that physical space of that painting. Uh, and I think then, of course, Mary Poppins came along. <laughs> that, and that really kind of blew my mind because I thought that's precisely what I want to do. I want to jump into Bert's chalk drawings on the sidewalk <laughs> on this fantastic journey. And obviously it didn't resonate with me until I was a bit older and had an understanding of how art works, but that always became the thing that I went back to in my mind was the genius of Mary Poppins to do that because that's really the sort of definition of the visceral experience when we look at a piece of art and we feel like we want to go inside of it. And they captured that in that film. Sorry, I, I digress a bit. Oh, no, no. this this. I is... always feel like that sort of really sums up and demonstrates the experience of being moved by a piece of art. This is the Titus Williver show. You can talk about whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Not the penguins waiting on the <laughs> <laughs> we are talking to Titus Williver, the actor known around the world as the Man in Black on Lost, Silas Adams on Deadwood, Jimmy O'Fallon on Sons of Anarchy, and of course the title role in the Amazon Prime crime drama Bosch. Season 5 of Bosch will premiere later in 2019, while the series has been renewed for a sixth season. Congratulations on the season 6 pickup. Thank you. Very, very excited about that. And of course, I'm excited for season five to come out. I've now seen all ten episodes in their completed uh, and edited state. And I'm very proud of the show. I'm very proud of it. And I think it's, um, you know, we have the source material, the books, which are so rich, obviously makes our job easier mm-hmm. in the sense that you've got such great material. And Connolly is a master storyteller. And he's created this character who's very relatable and accessible to people. And so in the process of moving that to a streaming series, it's been incredibly rewarding because the people that are dedicated to the books have become kind of equally dedicated to the show. Because I see how much joy people get from it, particularly the people who so love the books. I have people come up to me in airports and all over the place and they really want to talk about Harry Bosch. And, mm-hmm. and everyone has a different kind of story, you know, about when they first discovered the books. Or In the beginning, that was difficult for me because I didn't have the knowledge that I have now of the character. But um, it makes me very happy, and I'm very proud of the show, and I think this, this, we just get better and better. This season that's coming up is um, we use the book Two Kinds of Truth. That's the one interesting thing about it when... We say which book we're using. People who have read the books, they know the beginning, the middle, and the end of the story, but it requires great skill on Eric Overmeyer and Daniel Pine and Tom Bernardo and our other writers. Great skill, because we don't do a straight adaptation. Mm -hmm. We've never followed the books chronologically. Really, the cases become the center of it, but we jump around a bit. And I think that keeps it strong. And, you know, we also... uh, We jump into the personal lives of some of the other characters, but not too much, because the thing that people really tune in for the show is that they want to watch Harry work the case, because the way that it's designed is that the audience becomes, like they do in the books, they become invested in the investigation, and they're experiencing the investigation with Harry in real time when they're watching the show. 
to dovetail on something we talked about a little while ago, yes, you have the knowledge of having not only done 40 episodes prior to starting season five, but also the knowledge and insight of having read Connolly's novels. So when you start working on the current season, you have an image in your mind of what you want to do, but at the same time, like your other work, it's a blank slate in that respect, right? Yeah, absolutely. Although I, I will say that the books in that regard, aside from the pure pleasure of reading the books, there will be things that are in the books that the writers might not necessarily have cherry-picked into the process of writing the episode. Mm-hmm. I can sit down with them and, and with Mike and, and say, hey, there's a great thing in the book where X, Y, and Z happens. Let's put that in there. And a lot of the stuff, I call them Harry's Easter eggs. It's become <laughs> such a, a society of, you know, I kind of laugh a little bit when people say, yes, well, this whole Easter egg thing. is, And I say, it's not new. It's not anyone who's ever done puzzles. Or it's a box of Cracker Jacks. Yeah. It's a gumball machine. It's all the things that people of a certain age grew up with. I mean, I'm sure when you were a kid, when you were walking out of the supermarket, you know, you had those machines lined up, and some of them were grab bag things. When they were like a quarter, and that was a big deal. My mother would be like, are you sure you want to <laughs> quarter on that? But, you know, the, those were the things that you didn't know. You were either going to get some tattoos, and you might get a, a Super Bowl, or some crappy little rubber guy with a plastic parachute attached to his back, but... You know, we do a lot of those little gumball things. I'll find them in the books. or um, We've thrown a few things out there, particularly uh, we like to pay homage to some of our favorite films. The season before last, when Bosch boards this boat of one of the bad Special Forces guys, and he's looking around, and he finds uh, a bunch of cash, and then he finds his fake IDs on one of the passports. It says Walter E. Kurtz. <laughs> Arlen, Arlen Brando's character The horror, the horror Yeah, exactly yeah. So just those little things Those things will go by And then all of a sudden somebody will pop up on Twitter And, and they'll have nailed it We've got a couple of this season One that I know is going to be particularly tricky But I know, I know eventually Someone will find it called out And those things are fun Aside from the whole process of making the show yeah. is a great deal of fun doing things like that and finding new things in the book to pop in there. You know, I don't have a mustache, and, and Harry Bosch has a mustache in a lot of the books, and people have oftentimes said, why don't, why don't you have the mustache? Why don't you have the mustache? So I said to Connolly, I said, well, we have this opportunity now. Harry Bosch has been suspended for six months. So he can't go to work as a cop. So let's just say, for argument's sake, that uh, he decides not to shave. Mm-hmm. Decides not to cut his hair. So when we come back, we find him with a big old beard. Yeah. Well, yeah, but he can't have a beard. And I said, no, I know he can't have a beard as a cop. He's not Serpico. But let's do a scene where he shaves it off and leaves the mustache. And then Connelly and Overmeyer said, well, no, let's do it where he's FaceTiming with his daughter and leaves the mustache, and she kind of goes, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> let's, at, let's at least give the hardcore Harry Bosch fans of the novels, let's give them a, a glimpse of Harry with a mustache. Yeah. And, and I have to say, you know, I just call those moments a, a smile. You know, there's a, it's a little smile and a tip of the hat. I mean, I've wanted to do a season with the mustache, but the guys always go, no, 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 let's not do it. Well, plus, there's a fine line. You have to acknowledge the readership of the Connolly's novels. I mean, what was it, 58 million copies sold, something like that? That's, a, that's, <clears> that's a, just a couple. That's a big audience, but at the same time, Harry, the TV character, is not Harry, the character in the novels, because the TV series is a separate sort of thing. So while one right. is grounded in the other, they're both separate things. So to me, that's why Harry doesn't have a mustache in the TV show. Yeah, no, and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, it would be, you know, also just from... Although beards are very, um, people always laugh because yeah. as, soon as, as soon as I stop shaving, as soon as we finish the show, 
there's two things that happen. I stop shaving, and I always get the flu. <laughs> Can you imagine the flu? All the months that went through the show, if I sneeze, I go, oh, no, 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 I can't get sick. Because I'm working every day. Yeah. Like, I, I, I can't get sick. So I, I spend all of that time finding every kind of wellness concoction that I can have to absolutely ensure that I will not get sick. Typically, by the time we roll around, because we finish about a week after Thanksgiving, the week before Thanksgiving or a couple weeks before that, crew members, all of a sudden you go, oh, where's Sarah? Oh, where's Bill? Yeah. Everybody hangs on. It's inevitable that it catches up and, and creeps in. Do you take airborne? Yeah, I find with a lot of those homeopathic things, timing is the essence. Yeah. Stuff. It's a, like that stuff that I, it took me 20 years to learn how to pronounce it, oscillococcinum, which you may <laughs> see in every health food store. Yeah. But, you know, that stuff is, I love that they say, at the first signs of feeling poorly, are you kidding me? Sometimes I just wake up in the morning and for whatever reason, you know, it could be, maybe the air conditioning was set a little bit too high. So I'll wake up and go, oh, could I be getting a cold? <laughs> Let me start taking some oscillococcinum. It never works for me. I'll run to the stuff. And, of course, I'll realize that I've completely missed the wellness trolley. Yeah. And I say to the guy, hey, I don't want to take that stuff. Cause it, oh, no, no, no. But, you know, it works. You just have to get there at the right time. Yeah. But, well, that's kind of ridiculous. You can get some of these Theraflu things or whatever, and now I call it the bombing of the flu. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, it's a three-pronged attack with all of that over-the-counter stuff and sleep, and typically you can get through it. We're talking to Titus Williver. Titus Williver, the star of the Amazon Prime series, Bosch. We'll take a quick time out, and we'll continue our conversation with Titus here on TV Confidential. Buying or selling a home can be one of the most stressful things we'll ever do in life. But it doesn't have to be. And no one knows better than our friends at Front Porch Realty Group. Their community of realtors serving the Northern Bay Area of California that cares about their clients as individuals first and foremost. Whether you're a first-time buyer or looking to lease or sell your property in the Bay Area, Front Porch Realty Group will help you through this important transition by providing you with the right information for your situation while lessening the pain. They also work with a network of realtors throughout California who provide the same high caliber of customer service. Call Front Porch Realty Group at 415-886-7411 for a realtor referral near you. You can also visit their website, frontporchrealtygroup.com, for more information on the services they provide, including upcoming workshops and seminars. For more information, call 415 415- 886-7411 or visit frontporchrealtygroup.com Front Porch Realty Group They'll find the solution that works best for you. One more item January 23rd, 2019 marks the 100th anniversary of the birth of television's original genius Ernie Kovacs and to mark the occasion our friends at Shell Factory have put together Ernie Kovacs the Centennial Edition. Ernie Kovacs, the Centennial Edition, a nine DVD box set that combines previously released volumes to bring you a cornucopia of Ernie's greatest and most memorable hits, including episodes from his NBC primetime show, his five classic ABC TV specials from the early 1960s, the rare color version of Ernie's legendary silent show, Eugene, the only existing filmed solo interview with Kovacs himself. Ernie's award-winning commercials for Dutch Master Cigars, plus a collection of short films, and a whole lot more. Ernie Kovacs, the Centennial Edition, is available now wherever DVDs are sold through our friends at Shout Factory. The Beverly Hills Theater Guild annually sponsors the Julie Harris Playwright Awards Competition to discover new theatrical works and to encourage established or emerging writers to create quality works for the theater. The Julie Harris Playwright Awards Competition offers three prizes. First prize, $3,500. Second prize, $2,500. Third prize, $1,500. This year's competition runs from January 1, 2019 to April 1, 2019 and is open to all U.S. citizens or legal residents. All entries must be original, full-length plays that are unpublished, unproduced, and not currently under any option. 
Entries must be accompanied by the application form and in accordance with the submission policies and procedures. All entries must be postmarked by April 1, 2019. To download an application form for the Julie Harris Playwright Awards competition or for more information on submission policies and procedures, go to BeverlyHillsTheaterGuild.com and click Award Competitions. Hi, this is Joni Bovell, and you are listening to TV Confidential. Ed Robertson and author guest Titus Wellover. Titus Wellover, the star of the Amazon Prime series, Bosch. Titus's other TV credits include Deadwood, NYPD Blue, Third Watch, The Twilight Zone, The Closer, Star Trek Voyager, The Last Ship, The Good Wife, Sons of Anarchy, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Lost, while his motion picture credits include Navy Seals, The Doors, Mobsters, Zero Tolerance, Mulholland Falls, Air Force One, Gone Baby Gone, Argo, and Transformers, Age of Extinction. Season 5 of Bosch will premiere later in 2019. You can follow Titus on Twitter at Williver underscore Titus. We're talking about how at the end of a season, inevitably, your body breaks down. And I can understand why, because even though I'm new to the Bosch world, I watched the first half of season one last night. And if season one is typical of the other seasons of Bosch, there's a lot of night shooting, which tests the body. And you're on screen like 90% of the time. So that's a demanding role, isn't it? Yeah, but in the best possible way. Yes. I mean, you know, I always sort of thought that when I've done other series, in number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, twenty-five on the call sheet, mm-hmm. I've been asked that. Oh my gosh, you know, you must be. Well, it's it's the same job that I've ever done as an actor. It's just a lot more hours. Yeah, <laughs> which is fine because you know what I typically realize it's just one of those things where when that which you do to make your living is your sustenance Mm -hmm. in the absolute definition of the word. If I'm not working, and there have been times when I come off the show and I'm really, really tired, and I will, I typically will take, you know, we get done around the first week of December, Mm -hmm. I'll decompress and I'll sort of run to the airplane and fly back um, to, uh, to, we have a home in northwestern Connecticut Mm -hmm. up in the boonies, and I will run there just to completely decompress. And it's not to necessarily sleep late or anything like that. I just go there because it's really quiet mm-hmm. and there's a tremendous amount of solitude and I, you know, I walk in the woods and sometimes just sit outside. Some of that informs paintings later on. But it is demanding, but it's also one of those things where thankfully I've been doing this for a long time mm-hmm. and I'm still um, that experience of going to work every day and being excited is there, 100%. And that's not always the case. Throughout my career, I've been a guest star in lots of shows and seen the lead actress on the shows. And the show's great, and they're good people and all that, but you can tell they're not they're not loving it. I love it. Now, I'm also shooting 10 episodes mm-hmm. a season. I'm not shooting 22 or 26. Right. It's not that I would love it any less. But the uh, well, no. The demands of shooting a ten-episode series is not the same as a twenty-two-episode series and a twenty-two-episode network series, which is a whole different ball of wax. But you just anticipated one of my questions, Titus, which is having worked on many other films and many other TV shows, you had a chance to observe the lead sets the tone on a series. And now that you are the lead of your own series, it sounds like you've brought what you've learned from your other experiences and you apply it as the leader on your own set. Well, I'm a big believer in that it's a lot of hard work. The mm-hmm. hours are really, really long. And it's a process. You know, it's, it's a process. We're not doing a puppet show. Mm-hmm. I mean, it requires tremendous uh, commitment of time and, and extremely hard work. I also say, you know, I can sit here and piss and moan like a baby and go, oh, I'm tired. Well, yeah, everybody's tired. So if I'm tired and I'm there for 16 hours shooting, we'll mm-hmm. say, uh, and some days are, are very much that. Yeah, and fi- There are and other people that have been there for, the hair and makeup people have been there two hours, sometimes three hours mm-hmm. prior to my arrival mm-hmm. because they've got to come in and prepare a whole bunch of other uh, 
people for the day. We have teamsters. We have grips, electrics. I mean, it's a huge machine. We've been really fortunate that there's been very minimal turnaround. I mean, the people that are on the show now and our crew are mm-hmm. the same people, a lot of them that were on the pilot mm-hmm. and or the first season. And while I'm sure they would love to be doing 22 episodes just from from the standpoint of that steady work, they go off and do other shows intermittently. And a lot of them end up on, a bunch of our guys were all together on Get Shorty. Mm-hmm. I give them a shout out just because I've got a bunch of friends on that show and, and I think it's a great show. A bunch of our crew were over there. A bunch of our crew ended up over on the Orville and some of them over on uh, Jack Horner. And I ran into Arnold Boslu, who we had in season three of Bosch. Great actor, most notably the Mummy films. He was Emotep, mm-hmm. a wonderful actor. He was off um, doing Jack Ryan, another Amazon show, and my friend John Krasinski and Wendell Pierce. So it's everybody can kind of jump around and stay steady and then kind of boomerang back. Years ago, I did an episode of NCIS, Mm -hmm. and I was really taken by how Mark Harmon was with the crew. Um, It was a really pleasurable experience. The people were sweet. The crew were all working hard, but everyone was having a good time. It was sort of the thing of when you're going to go and look at a at a school for your child. And when you see a bunch of kids that are engaged and they're running around and they're smiling, you think to yourself, yeah, well, this is where I'd like my child to go to school. And when you go to a set and people are smiling and laughing and not losing their sense of humor yeah. of the, the quest to get the work completed, you go, that's what I want. And I saw that and I thought, if well, when I'm doing a series, that's how I want it to be. And it was interesting because actually Mark's son who does stunts came in this season and you know I was talking to him and I did one of the things that I said to him was I I've worked with a lot of people in the business and I have to say your father was an inspiration treated everybody with tremendous kindness and not in an artificial way yeah peer leading or anything like that so that's how it should be so that's a long-winded no it's creating an environment where people want to be there yeah because I've been on sets where actors don't talk to each other because mm-hmm. they can't stand each other they're fighting with producers, or they're fighting with writers, and they're grumbling, and, and you can see it in the crew, and it's endless drudgery and pain, and people just kind of servicing a paycheck. We've all done jobs like that, mm-hmm. and I don't want to do that job. You know, I, I mean, do I hate looking at the call sheet or the advance schedule and seeing that we're going to be four nights at the Bosch house? <laughs> you know, we're, and, we did a, and we did a fair amount. One of the first things I did on my first read of the pilot script for Bosch was I went back and looked in the script to see how many scenes said exterior night. (laughs) What I knew that I didn't want to do was sign up for a Michael Mann nightmare (laughs) where, you know, I'm basically a vampire because it it does. It absolutely screws with your equilibrium Uh and and it's hard. You know, it's hard to bounce back. But we've found a way to kind of, um, Frankie Tignini, who's in charge of all of that, really has figured out a way and a formula to do that so that the crew doesn't completely, you know, lose their minds or burn out. It still doesn't make it any more fun. And, you know, we're doing a show about a guy who investigates homicide. So <laughs> we're not, you know, I'm not, we're not doing the reboot of Magnum in Hawaii. Exactly, exactly. You know, we're in Boyle Heights at, five in the morning mm-hmm. and going, oh, that's that's an amazing smell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad you can't bottle that. You know, or, or, you know if, if you could, I, I, when I was a teenager, I wish you could have bottled that. Yeah. I, would have, I would have sought some revenge against my... <laughs> We're talking to Titus Welliver. Titus Welliver, the star of the Amazon Prime series, Bosch. Season five of Bosch will premiere sometime later in 2019, while the first four seasons of Bosch are available right now for streaming on demand on Amazon Prime. You can follow Titus on Twitter at Welliver underscore Titus, as well as on Instagram at Titus Welliver Official and at Welliver Art. As I said, I'm halfway through season one. Jason Gedrick is the main antagonist in season one. 
And Jerry Ryan has a pivotal role in season two. You worked with Jason on, I forget, it was a short- Falcone. Falcone. You, you worked with Jason on Falcone, and you worked with Jerry on Star Trek Voyager. I would imagine as an actor, it can be very beneficial to work with an actor that you've worked with before, because that way you could just focus on the work, the character, what you have to do when you're shooting scenes together. Oh, absolutely. And then Jason and I, when we did Falcone, we worked together a lot. I mean, we were the two leads of that series, so we worked together a lot and became really, really good friends. And I had nothing to do with the casting of him. They threw his name out, ultimately, for the Waits character. Mm-hmm. And I said, that's a great idea. Have you talked to him about it? Because the character of Waits, is not what we've seen Jason play in the past. Yeah, I mean, I always think of him in season one, a murder one, where he was just yeah, murder up. one yeah. and the last Don, and you know, he always played these very um, cool. Um, you know, he's a very handsome guy. He has great presence on screen, but his performance, his weights, was really riveting. Uh, yeah, phenomenal. He yeah, did a great job. And I teased him about it. I said, "Yeah, you see what happened." You want to mix it up a little bit? And I said, this will come out. You're going to get offered every crazy ass. <laughs> and, and, you know, and he said to me, that's okay. Yeah. You know, but I said, yeah, but, you know, that's that becomes the thing. Yeah. Then you have to make the decision how many times you want to try to reinvent that wheel. Yeah. And Jerry Ryan, I can't even really remember if I had any dialogue exchange with her at all in Voyager. I did two episodes. I did the finale and then the season opener. Mm-hmm. But she and I became friends on Voyager. That's where we met. Mm-hmm. We became really, really good friends. And I think that was because we realized that we were kindred spirits mm-hmm. and that we were complete goofballs. And when people would come up to me after I did the show, they would say, oh, and you worked with Jerry Ryan. Is she really intense? And I went, no. She said, well, why do you? Well, you know, Ryan. I went, yeah, that's the character she plays. Exactly. It's called acting. She's like, <laughs> she's, a, she's a Borg who's been rehabilitated. That's not Jerry. Jerry's hilarious. I get the same thing with Lance Reddick. People so often will say, oh, it must be very intense working with Lance Reddick. And I go, no, we don't. They're like, do you guys do all this preparation? I say, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll discuss the scene. But we're not usually talking about the scene. We're usually talking about comic books. Yeah. And they go, what? And I say, yeah, Lance and I are absolute comic book, pop culture, Marvel Comics, crazy people. And that's where we go down the rabbit hole to when they go, hey, guys, we're ready for you now. And we go, oh, yeah, we'll be there in a minute. We're just talking about Iron Man. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I've, I've destroyed that mystique of the committed artists, right? We're well, talking about comic books. Yeah, well, look, you know, just going back to Bosch, if you are Harry Bosch 24-7, uh, even 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 when the camera's not rolling, I mean, that would take no, a, I, Yeah, you can't do that. Well, I'd also probably be in a mental health... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've, I've found out that I have the ability to separate myself now from the character. I mean, there are, there's certainly a bit of me in Harry Bosch, so yeah. my kids will be watching it, and they'll go, ooh, ooh. I know that look. What are you talking about? They go, that look you just gave that guy. Yeah. I see that. I don't know what that means. What do you mean you know what that means? Dad, that's you. That's your face. Yeah. I go, oh, well, guilty as charged. We're talking to Titus Welliver. Titus Welliver, the star of the Amazon Prime series, Bosch. Season 5 of Bosch will premiere sometime later in 2019, while the first four seasons of Bosch are available right now. For streaming on demand on Amazon Prime. You can follow Titus on Twitter at Welliver underscore Titus as well as on Instagram at Titus Welliver Official and at Welliver Art. You mentioned talking comic books with your co-star on Bosch, Lance Reddick. I understand that one of the things you do to decompress when the spirit moves you is you binge watch old TV shows from the 60s. Uh, oh, yeah. Do you have any favorites? I mean... I kind of run the whole, I recently went on a Julian Anderson thing where I did Fireball and all of the Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet, Joe 90. Oh, yeah. Um, so I went through that. 
that's a, I, I have to say, this is not just because I want to have the Amazon. You know, Shout Factory, they bring, do a lot of horror and science fiction films. Y- yes, yes, they do. Um, yeah. And I'm mad for them. Well, they've got their own channel mm-hmm. on Amazon. Yeah, uh, Shout Factory TV, I think, yeah. Yeah, so I've lost my mind. <laughs> Gary Anderson, and then there were several. So, and then after that, Juliet Landau, Martin Landau and Barbara Bain's daughter, mm-hmm. is a, a, has a really great role in this season of Bosch. She's fantastic. I'm, I'm very happy for everyone to see the beautiful work that she does. But I did both seasons of Space 1999, and then I'm sitting there and I forgot. I'm like, oh my God, that's Roy Dotrice. Mm-hmm. All these great guest actors. And I thought that show was, was really, really, I don't know, I love it. I mean, I love sci-fi. The Jerry Anderson stuff has really resonated. Uh, I've been watching Dark Shadows, if you remember that one. Yes. Not the Tim Burton film, but no, the old no, with, opera. with uh, Jonathan Frid and Catherine Lee Scott and, yeah. and all that, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm always in the process of looking at those old shows. I did a Honey West bid. My kids really like the... Uh, the Tom Cruise Mission Impossible flicks. I said, yeah, they're great. You should watch the, the show. Yeah. And we started watching uh, Mission Impossible again. Stephen Hill, who, you know, was a great actor. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, kind of did Mission Impossible and then kind of went away for a while and came back in Law and & Order. I mean, mm-hmm. one of the great, I sort of look at his work and I go, why, why wasn't this guy just working nonstop? So we did a few seasons of that. Yeah, I'm always, the, you know, green horn up. Back and look at the stuff. We've got the uh, Captain Marvel movies. Well, there's the Marvel one, and then there's also the Shazam. Yes. Captain Marvel. And um, so my sons were very excited about that. I said, well, there was a Saturday morning show. Yeah. So I found it on DVD and I gave it to my middle child. And uh, it's funny because it's a bit cheesy. Yeah. But it's still, you know, and then we went into that to the far out space nut. <laughs> Bounced over to HR Puff and stuff, and I was like, "So what's, what's cool is that with my son, they're always game to for any of that, mm-hmm. provided. I mean, it's an equal exchange. My daughter tends to kind of roll her eyes and go, uh, <laughs> uh, she's not a, as into it, but they'll they'll sit down and binge Johnny Quest and you know cartoons from the '60s and the '70s and some stuff that you know I forget because <laughs> Marty Cross stuff. I mean, that was such a great steady diet mm-hmm. of shows that they put out and of course they brought back Sigmund and the Sea Monster mm-hmm. last year and Electro Woman yeah <laughs> which was um, was it Deirdre Hall who yeah. played yes she was yeah, she, yeah. in the original yeah. yeah 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 yeah. one of those confusing shows you watch as a kid and you go why do I like this show so much I'm a boy yes <laughs> I've got all the theme songs bubbling in my head at the moment but I won't oh yeah <laughs> it's, no it's, it's very easy I actually all the um, Johnny Quest, not only the the opening theme and the closing theme, but the incidental music uh-huh. and the the underlaid music, it's really good. Mm-hmm. I mean, I still think that's one of the the best cartoon openings of all time is the Johnny Quest theme. I think it's- my friend John Burlingame, who covers music for Variety and a lot of the trade publications, he would agree with you. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's really good. <laughs> um, you know, that was the thing. Interesting that you look back at those shows that Hanna Barbera did. I mean, even I can remember going to a concert years ago, and they did the Flintstones opening theme. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously they did it without the, the song. They were just playing the music, and it's a tight piece of music. It's really tight. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. There was a different level of uh, commitment back then. You know, it was not these kind of silly little. Which is not to deny or diminish the, no, no, no. the silly little songs, but there was good stuff. Lots of good stuff. Okay, final question. Season five of Bosch will premiere sometime in 2019. And we pulled all the stops out in season five. I think we took it to a whole different level, and I think people, um, the stakes and and the peril are as high, if not higher, than they've ever been for the character. So I'm really interested to see how the audience handles that because uh you know harry bosch undercover he's not an undercover cop there's some really really intense stuff and a lot of great guest actors as i said we've got juliet landau mimi rogers comes back c thomas howell came to play bess armstrong some really really great great actors that 
came to swing as well. So get ready for that. And if you haven't watched all four seasons of Bosch, you can get ready for season five by binge watching, by going back to seasons one, two, three, and four. They're all available season four streaming on demand at Amazon Prime. Titus Williver, thank you so much for joining us, spending part of your day today. I hope you'll visit us again on TV Confidential. I will absolutely do that, and it was a, it was a great pleasure, and thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. We'll continue our conversation about TV series finales next on TV Confidential. Story Salon is Los Angeles' longest-running storytelling venue. We have live shows every Wednesday in Studio City, as well as solo shows, podcasts, CDs, and several books. Los Angeles Daily News calls Story Salon gemstones of narrative, something new, funny, astonishing. Sunset Magazine says, tales tall, tragic, and tantalizing. All of this makes Story Salon one of the most eclectic entertainment experiences available. You can learn more about us by going to our Facebook page or by visiting our website at www.storysalon.com. Uber is the mobile app that connects you with a driver for immediate transportation. Request a ride at the tap of a button and you have a driver curbside in minutes. You can choose to be driven in a black car, SUV, or you can choose UberX, the low-cost Uber for a ride in a hybrid or mid-range car. Payment is seamless and cashless. Build to your card on file with no need to tip. Enter the promo code TV Confidential. After you download the app to receive a free first ride up to $20. For more information, go to get.uber.com forward slash go forward slash TV Confidential. Ed Robertson, author friend Donna Allen Figueroa, who I understand has a new book out. Yes, it's entitled Fall Again Beginnings. It's the first part of a four part contemporary romantic series uh, set against the background of working actors. Something that you know a a thing or two about. Well, you write what you know, and I have been working in the business for several years. It is not necessarily autobiographical, but it's based on... Sure, many of the experiences that the actors in my book have, many have happened to me, many have happened to friends of mine. It's not, if you're looking for Valley of the Dolls, it's not, it's grounded in reality. It is grounded in reality, and it's the first in a series. Yes. Called the Fall Again series. Fall Again. Which is available as a paperback as well as an ebook and in Kindle at fallagainseries.com. Hi, this is Michelle Lee, and you're listening to TV Confidential. Ed Roberts with a reminder that the next edition of TV Confidential will premiere next week on the station at the usual time. Our guests will include Emmy Award winning actress Loretta Swit. We hope you'll join us for that. In the meantime, Tony Figueroa and Donna Allen are with us as we continue our conversation with Douglas Howard and David Biancooli. Doug and David are the co editors and two of the contributors of Television Finales. Television Finales from Howdy Doody to Girls. The last word on TV. Endings in a book that shows how, in many respects, the final episode of a TV show eliminates the entire series itself. Television Finales is available in bookstores everywhere through Syracuse University Press. You can also find it at Amazon.com, SyracuseUniversityPress.syr.edu, and wherever books are sold online. You'll recall that in our first hour, we pointed to the final episode of Sex and the city as an example of a series finale that left a lot to be desired as we pick up the conversation. It's also because the show is called Sex in the City, and the city is New York. And so that is a star of the show as well. Uh, Michael Patrick King even, I think, referred to the city as the fifth he lady. Was, she was, yeah, the city was the fifth lady. I understand Michael Patrick King particularly disliked the series finale. And so... I think it's one thing when they come to L.A. and do an episode where they leave New York, and then they're so miserable in this other great city in America because it's not... Yeah, Yeah, but then, like, so much of the finale is Paris, and then you go to the movies, and they're traveling all around the world. It kind of takes away part of what made... It would be like taking away one of the four ladies and saying you're, you're missing something there. So, you know, the movie should have had... You know, I think they forgot their mission statement, or they forgot what the title was. If I can jump in here, you've hit such a great point. It's because the only reason that 
the creator of Sex in the City is upset with the ending is that he didn't stick around for that part of it. It's sort of like Dexter had a perfect finale, but that showrunner left, and then somebody else kept the show going for another couple of seasons, and it wasn't as good. So yeah. some of these things, if they're like books, you don't expect a book for the author to leave two-thirds yeah. of the way through mm-hmm. and let somebody else finish the damn thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's unusual that someone would hand a novel off. You're not going to see Dickens hand a novel off to someone else and say, finish it. Um, <laughs> yeah. no, true. Which brings us to Seinfeld. At least Larry David came back and yes. had a direct hand in yes. in the finale, like it or not. And again, I'm in the minority. I like the ending of Seinfeld. Uh, but too. that's because by that time I was already a college professor and teaching TV, and I had shown the very first episode of the very first season of the Seinfeld Chronicles where George and Jerry were arguing about whether a button should be two buttons open or two. The same fight they had at the very end, which means they learned nothing. Nothing had changed. I mean, you think about the ending of Seinfeld, and we're not gonna, probably not going to see this again. That finale was so big, and the hype around it was, was so significant and that like, I think there were some shows. I think TV Land actually canceled their programming for the evening and they just had something on the screen like, go watch the Seinfeld finale and then come back when it's over. You're not going to see that. People just conceding the, the night and just saying, we know it's going to be so big that no one else is going to watch anything else. Was the public satisfied with the Seinfeld finale? Not even my editors were satisfied. <laughs> yeah. No. But I don't think so, yeah. You know, the New York TV critic for two front page, they called them woods, where as soon as the show was over, I had to write the review and it was the front page story. Mm-hmm going out on the streets of New York. One was for The Sopranos, and one was for Seinfeld. And both they hated the ending and the fact that I didn't hate the ending. (laughs) (laughs) Going back to Cheers, like Seinfeld, the last scene is a reverse of the first scene of the first episode in Cheers, where Sam goes down that hallway. The first episode of Cheers, he comes out that hallway to an empty bar. Isn't that good? That's right, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the idea of having some sense of full circle. Yeah, and that kind of touches on one of the common threads of virtually every chapter in television finales, David and Doug, is that in each chapter, in discussing the final episode, you also kind of discuss the show itself and how you know everything kind of builds to the finale and how a good finale comes full circle. Yeah, I, it's funny. so why are you talking about the full circle? I'm like... Here we are, we're back to Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's a full time. Dick Van Dyke was like the most important show on TV. Like, that's why it, when we talk about people handing the shows off, I'm happy to see when the showrunners do stick around, like Vince Gilligan sticks around, or Sean Ryan, like when they see the thing to complete, because they probably have the vision for it, right? So when you see that, and you're like, well, this is probably how, this is how it's supposed to look. Like this, It sort of makes sense when you get to the end of it. I seem to remember reading someplace where Sean Ryan said he always knew that Vic Mackey was going to walk. And I was kind of surprised to see that. I'm like, oh my God, Vic Mackey's going to walk? I mean, he doesn't completely walk, but he walks. And, you know, after all the stuff that he did over the, the course of the series, like, wow, but okay, I kind of get it. And the same thing with what happens to Walter White. Like, you're like, all right, I kind of get it. Okay, I can see what, what they're doing now, having seen the whole thing. Along the same lines, we have an email question from one of our listeners Uh, this is from david listening to us in plant city florida david writes all good things the final episode of star trek the next generation all good things served as a bookend to the first episode of the series and while it was not a quote-unquote end of the series type of finale as these characters would carry on together in the next four motion pictures it did end the series on a very High point, the final scene of Captain Picard joining the rest of the crew, David continues for the regular poker night, was a wonderful send-off. Yeah, talking about the closure and non-closure, there's a scene just before that where Picard is talking to Q, and he says, Q, what is it that you're trying to tell me? And here's Q, like this alien who has a larger sense of the universe, and, uh, and he's happy that it, through the course of the episode, for one minute, Picard has kind of expanded his way of thinking And he's thinking in terms of different time periods working together. And so he says, what is it you're trying to tell me? 
and Q, the actor is, that plays it so well, he leans forward and is about to say something to him, and then he pulls back, yeah. and uh, and that's it. And so, again, you're like, well, there's more that he needs to know, or there, there's more that he's going to learn, but Q's never going to tell him. So you get like this, again, it's open-ended closure. On the line with us are Douglas Howard and David Bianculi, co-editors and two of the contributors of television finales from Howdy Doody to Girls, an exploration of some of the most compelling and often controversial final episodes in television history. we got a few minutes left. Before we end this, we talked about how we all liked the chapter on the Dick Van Dyke show. One of my other favorite chapters, and this is one uh, that you wrote, David, you wrote a chapter on the final episode of Nichols. Yeah, and, and I commend that only because very few people would even include Nichols in a conversation in series finales. Very few people include Nichols in any conversation. Yeah, exactly. Right? I was, it shows it. Yeah, it was, it's a memorable finale for a show that few people remember. And here's the deal. I said that for newspapers in New York, I got to write about the finales of The Sopranos and Seinfeld and shows like that, so I didn't feel the need to Bigfoot any of our other authors who were coming in with enthusiasm to write about those. So I set off to write about things that I liked that I probably wasn't going to take from anybody else. Mm -hmm. And so one of them was Nichols, which was James Brenner's show after Maverick, before the Rockford Files. And it was a, a Western set in like 1914 in Arizona. And he plays a cowardly kind of guy, just as all of James Garner's characters are, and the network wanted him to be more heroic, and he thought that, and so the network canceled it, and he sort of, James Garner went out with a bang, and in the opening sequence of the finale, he killed his character <laughs> off. Dead. There's still a whole hour to go, and yeah. he's dead. His twin brother comes to town, played by James Garner, who's, who's much more heroic, everything the network wanted. And he decides he doesn't like the town, and at the end of the hour, talking to the sunset, and leaves and says, the hell with you guys, which is what James Garner was doing to New York. And he rides off not on a horse, but on a Harley Davidson mm -hmm. in 1914. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that. Yeah, and the final shot is, as Garner's riding off on the motorcycle, you have a close-up of... The sign, you are now leaving Nichols. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's so good. And I did a lot of research on this, and a lot of people have written over the years that this was James Garner's desperate attempt, unsuccessful, to try and get a second series out of the show, to get NBC to renew it. But they already canceled it. This was James Garner's just, oh no. This is him saying exactly what he thought of NBC because he loved that character. Which, fast forward a few years later, that kind of speaks to why NBC was reluctant to sign Jim again when it came to the Rockford Files, but that's a subject for another conversation. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But James Garner, you can call me back for any conversation about James Garner. What a great actor. Very good. Actor. You know, what's incredible about that finale, too, is David was telling me about it, and I was like, are you serious? His twin brother? What? <laughs> yeah. I, I had to go online and look at it, because like, you wouldn't believe that this actually happened. You're like, what? And actually, I want to say, to, to tie it to something else, that David, you felt that David Chase was doing the same thing with the end of The Sopranos, that this was similar to what, what happened at the end of Nichols with James Garner? I do feel that. I do feel that. Uh, David Chase is always close to the best about exactly what he feels and why he did what he did. But I think there was always a little bit of, oh, you think that you know how I should end The Sopranos? I'll end The Sopranos. I'll show you. I'm trying to remember one of the things that Chase said at the time, this is going back to 2007 when the finale of The Sopranos aired, is that he asked viewers to think of that final scene as... Okay, when a show premieres, you enter the lives of these characters midstream. And, you know, maybe in the pilot of the first few episodes, you're brought up to speed with what happened before you start watching their adventures. And then when the show ends, the show ends, and then you exit the lives of these characters. And as I understand, that was one of the things he had in mind when he had that blackout. I buy that completely. I will go on the record as saying I'm one of the people that believe that Tony Soprano lived past that yeah. blackout. Yeah. Yeah. Now I would say that too. I, going back to what Donna said, like, did I find that a satisfying finale 
Like, no, when I saw it, I remember thinking, I can't believe my TV's on the fritz now. <laughs> <laughs> now? Now my TV's going out? And then, probably like many people, I was like, how could this happen? How is this the end of the show? And you, I, I felt a lot of frustration about it. I guess I've grown to appreciate it. I'll throw something else out about it. There's one of the contributors to the book, Martha Nockamson, she wrote on Battlestar Galactica, and she had a, uh, an article that she wrote a, a couple years ago, I think, for Vox, where she actually got David Chase to say that Tony didn't die at the end. And after she got him to say it, I think he tried to retract it and everything. But, um, like, that's, again, it's one of those finales that doesn't quite end, and we're still talking about what happened at the end of The Sopranos. But I think it's brilliant, and, and it is now one of the all-time memorable finales, so good for Chase. Final question, is there a show that did not have a finale that you either think should have had one or that you would like to have seen oh, yeah. a finale for? Okay, you go first, Doug, and we'll see if... Are you going to say that would... I am. Which they yes. are making a finale to a final movie this year, finally. I mean, they yeah. really are going to... And they just ended. David Mills just stopped making Deadwood. There was no attempt at a finale. But now they're getting back all of the living actors and hopefully... Well, I'm sure they will do a great job. They just have to. I've been waiting for this for 10 years or more. Yeah, and you would think, you know, because some of the actors have gone on to other things that, like, they would never get that cast together. So it's a great thing to see. That's Yeah, I would say the same thing. That's a finale that I would be looking forward to. Douglas Howard and David Biancooli are the co-editors and two of the contributors to television finales. Television finales from Howdy Doody to girls available in bookstores everywhere through Syracuse University Press. You can also find it at Amazon.com, wherever books are sold online. David and Doug, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Boy, you guys watch a lot of TV. <laughs> <laughs> a reminder that Michael Learned is currently starring along with Lance Nichols in the Laguna Playhouse production of Driving Miss Daisy. Driving Miss Daisy is on stage at the Laguna Playhouse in Laguna Beach, California through Sunday, January 27th. For tickets and more information, call 949-497-2787, 949-497-2787, or go to lagunaplayhouse.com. Michael Leonard also co-stars along with John Wesley in the critically acclaimed short film, Second Acts. For more information on Second Acts, go to Second Acts Film. Dot com. Also a reminder that Season 5 of Bosch will premiere sometime later in 2019. Well, the first four seasons of Bosch are available right now for streaming on demand through Amazon Prime. You can follow Titus Williver on Twitter at Williver underscore Titus. You can also follow Titus on Instagram at Titus Williver Official as well as at Welliver Art. That'll do it for our program this week, folks. Ed Robertson, we have a Tony Figueroa, Donna Allen, Phil Grace, Greg Airbarner producer, Chris Corman. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time on TV Confidential. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying our podcast. If you're listening to us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TV Confidential, be sure to hit the subscribe button.